So the goal of this talk is that in Go, there are often many ways to do the same thing. And it's sometimes ambiguous which way you should choose. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a guidance and advice on what I wish I knew when I was writing libraries and kind of examples of how people are making these decisions. So the very first problem you're going to come into with uh, anything with a package is naming things, right? And there's this really great article on the Go blog about stuttering and kind of naming your packages that I definitely recommend you read. Uh, but some of the things that it didn't really point out is uh, the differences between maybe how you might name things in Go and how you might name things in other languages. And I believe it comes down to the idea that the package name is part of your object or your struct's name, right? So in Java, for example, you do an import statement, and then when people are writing code, they don't see the import statement, right? So you would make a buffered reader with new buffered reader. In Go, the package name is actually pretty important to how people are going to read your code. So you can see the Go equivalent. It's got some of the same words, right? Like they both say buff, they both say new, they both say reader. But the important part there is that you're considering the package name in your struct's name or in your function's name. And so there might be some examples of doing this maybe what I would call not optimally or incorrectly. And uh, the first part is in struct stuttering. So struct stuttering is generally okay in some cases, but I would say that the top example would be the worst case of struct stuttering. So if you had a package called client and you wanted to put a struct inside it, so you call it client. Now I'm 200 lines down the code and I see this thing client.client. .client. My thought is, which client is this, right? Like I have no idea what I'm actually looking at 200 lines down the code. Uh, with, there, so there's this new thing in Go 1.7, it's kind of been around as a library, but it's called context. And with context, this is a little bit more acceptable because you're probably not going to have more than one concept of a context in your library, right? So stuttering with context is, it's still stuttering, but it's something that's generally okay to do. The optimal example that I would definitely encourage you to write your code for would be the HTTP client. So here, when you read this code, right, you're 100 lines down the screen, you don't know the import statement, what do you read? You read HTTP.client. And that's because the package is part of the struct's name. So you know exactly what kind of client you're getting. So if you're gonna name your package client, you need to be aware that when people are very far down the screen, they have lots of clients they're talking to, they don't really know which client they're talking to. And an optimal example would be kind of thinking of the package name and the struct name together as people use it. Uh, as far as functions, stuttering is generally not allowed in any case. So at the bottom example, I made this function called new context and I put it in the context package. The stuttering is the repetition of context. And uh, so this is also, like you see how background is generally okay. It's in the context package. There's this function called background. If the package wasn't part of the function's name, then this would be really weird, right? Because you'd be looking at code and you'd see this function called background. You're like, background what? I have no idea what this is. But because the package name is part of the function name, like it gives you context huh, about what kind of background it is. So uh, general advice here, you really have to think of both of those names together. All right, so object creation is an interesting uh, conundrum in Go because there's no rigid constructor, right? So in a language like Java, uh, you have a constructor function, so where do you do your struct initialization? You do it in the constructor, right, obviously. With Go, there is no concept of a constructor function. So people kind of uh, jerry-rig these things together, they'll have a function called new or a function called new buffer. So there's generally like two ways to get your struct, right? One is just using the struct directly, like x equals http.client. The other is to kind of get it from a function. So there are some things you should consider if you're going to do this. Uh, so the first is using the zero value. So the zero value, uh, in my opinion at least, is the most readable way to get an object. 
And there are some properties of the Go language that make this uh, easy to work with. And so examples of the zero, zero value would be just making a variable right or assigning it. Uh, one great property is that read operations on nil built-ins actually work. And that's different than another language like Java, right, where if you have a null array list and you try to take the size of it, you just get an uh, exception. And that's not so true in Go. Um, using the struct directly is a little bit more difficult if you have like background Go routines that need to happen or some weird setup that needs to happen. Uh, so generally in those cases, people do use constructor functions and it's okay. But uh, I would strongly push you to making the struct itself work. And I'll explain a little bit about that later. But these are two examples of patterns in Go that people use to make the empty struct work. So the first example is in NetHttp. It's the HTTP server that's built into Go. And it's a struct, right? So the address is initially empty. And you probably want a default address of maybe 80 or 8080 or something like that. So what the server does is it assigns an address variable from the struct, and it says, oh, if it was empty, I'm gonna like assign it to this other thing. So that's a way you can kind of work around the idea that you don't actually have a constructor where maybe in Java or another language you would just assign it to port 80 in the constructor. And uh, an interesting property that I talked about, nils. So buffer, when it's empty, buff is nil, right? And offset is zero. So what if you couldn't do read operations on nil? This linked function would look really weird, right? Because you'd have to say, oh, if it's nil, then do this. If it's not, it'll do that. Uh, but because Go works well with nil operations, uh, it generally nil operations work the same as read operations on an empty. So the linked, oper linked function for buffer is pretty compact and pretty short. So these are properties of Go that actually help you with your using the struct directly. So the other way people get things is they use a constructor function, right? Uh, one of the things about the constructor function is that it can do anything. So I'll talk a little bit about that later, but it kind of adds uh, complexity to the reader. And one pattern that I've seen a lot of libraries use as a form of information hiding is to make a constructor function that returns an interface and then have a concrete implementation of that interface inside their package. So in this example, we have like an auth implementation, right? You have a new auth function that returns like some auth interface. The biggest issue with this type of code is that the auth interface tends to be really big if you do this. And really big interfaces are really hard to extend, right? So the easiest thing about an interface is when it's really small, you can implement one function, you're like good to go. When people do things like this, they're creating really large interfaces. And I think that, at least in my opinion, uh, using interfaces in Go should describe behavior. They shouldn't be a substitute for information hiding. So if you're using it as a substitute for information hiding, that's something you might want to like consider doing or not doing. So this is a, <clears throat> an example of just some generic RPC framework with two ways to create a client, right? So I have this function called direct use and this function called constructor. Uh, so my question for you is, does the function constructor spawn Go routines? Does the function constructor allocate a bunch of memory? And does the function constructor panic? And the answer to all of those is you don't know. Like to answer those questions, you have to go into the source of that constructor. And you can answer those questions for the function direct use, right? You know exactly how much memory it's gonna take, you know it's not gonna panic yet, and you know it's not spawning some Go routines. So it's really easy to understand this code. And um, just kind of as an aside, uh, people often talk about how they like programming in C. And you might wonder, like, why do these people like programming in C? Don't they like all this new fun stuff that's happened? And the reason I like programming in C is because it's a very what you see is what you get language. And there's not a lot of hidden things that's kind of interrupting the flow that you're seeing on your screen. And that's an advantage you give the users of your library if you directly work with a struct rather than making them go through a function to construct it. So there's the 
third less appealing option to construction, and that's just using a singleton. Um, the standard library has singletons all over the place. So XVAR, there's a singleton in there, there's a singleton in HTTP, singleton in RAND, there's a singleton in the logging. Um, I'm personally not a big fan of singletons. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about why I'm not a big fan of them, but that's generally, there's like a lot of stuff on the internet about why singletons aren't so good. I won't say never use singletons, because only a Sith deals in absolutes, but I will say, um, if you are going to use a singleton, the general pattern in Go of creating a singleton is to have a variable in your package that is a struct in your package, and then the singleton functions of that package, like print, just forward to that variable that's defined in the package. So the variable in the package becomes the singleton, and your public function is just forward to that interface. So this is the general pattern for singletons, but I really want to put a red flag on that and say, like, just please don't use singletons. Um, like, I've never refactored a code base and thought to myself, I'm so glad they use singletons. Like, oh, it's never happened. Um, the next thing you're wanna, gonna wanna consider is configuration. So your library is probably gonna have a lot of parameters, right? People need to kind of figure out the right way to get it going. Uh, one way to configure your library is with this uh, neat little hack of the language where you can have this like new server and you say, oh, it's got these options that are kind of Vardic. Um, so there's a few interesting blog posts that kind of propose this idea. It has not gained adoption and I think that's because it's like, uh, like when you see it, you go, oh, that's, that's kind of fun. But when you try to like write a real system that uses it, you're like, oh, this is like really difficult to use. Um, so people don't actually generally configure things like this. The m most popular way that people configure their library is with some kind of config struct. And uh, the main reason I like config structs is so writing a production system, you're going to probably have some kind of configuration management system, right? And what you can do is you can store this config struct as JSON inside your configuration management and then load it up and it can just be inside your struct when your program starts, right? So it's a way to have configuration management on load dynamically, right, for your library. So this is generally why people tend to prefer this method. It also easily documents the options that you actually have to call. Uh, sometimes the defaults don't work too well, like you want people to be able to set a speed to zero, but if they didn't set a speed to zero, you want it to be like 60. And to get around that, people will use constructor functions for their config, so they'll have a function called uh, default config, and it'll return a config that has speed set to 20 or 30, and then you can overwrite it to zero. Uh, so that's generally configging. The next part is logging. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a logging counter example. So this is what I would consider generally the worst way to do logging in a library. And there are three, way, three reasons I think this is the worst. Uh, one, you're printing directly to a standard stream. Uh, you do not know what the consumer of your library wants that stream to actually have or not have. Uh, the second is that there are many logging frameworks, right? So uh, I'm a big fan of structured logging, and that's not part of the Go framework. Um, there's lots of other logging frameworks that are also structured. And you're, you're kind of making an opinion about how logging should be, when really that's an opinion that should kind of be given to the library. And the worst part about this is that you can't turn it off, which is terrible, um, super terrible. So, my logging advice. Uh, first part of logging advice, I would say, is try not to log, right? Um, if you can push these messages up the stack with, maybe it's an error, so you errored it up the stack, uh, you don't need to make a decision about logging in your library. Logging is generally just a callback. So another way would be, Instead of having a generic log that prints like a string, you could have a callback that says do this when user ID is zero, do this when that. Um, in essence, logging is a callback. It's just like the one callback to rule them all, right? Uh, I would definitely recommend logging to an interface so that you do not make assumptions about what I think the right logging library is. 
And uh, please don't print to standard out and standard error without a way for me to override that or turn it off. Um, please don't do that. Just, like, respect my authority for standard error and standard out. Uh, so a better logging example. So this is what I would consider a better logging example. So the server object has a logger, right, that I've kind of defined in my package. And whenever I want to do logging, I can just call the log method on the server, and it can say, oh, you have a logger set, so I'm going to forward it through. You can even do default. You can say something like, oh, it's set. If it's nil, then I'll just log the standard out, so at least I can turn it off. Um, can we do better? Yes, structured logging. I super love structured logging. Um, a lot of people uh, don't necessarily. I would say that um, the, the power between structured logging and not structured logging is similar to the power between like subversion and Git. Like uh, you, you use subversion and you think, oh, subversion's awesome, like I don't need Git, and then you like start using the advanced features of Git and you're like, wow, how do I go back? Um, so that's kind of my opinion on structured logging. But you'll notice with this package I'm not even making uh, an opinion on that. I'm just saying this is a logging interface you can use. Cool, so the next part is interfaces. Um, a lot of text on this slide. Uh, I think the most important one is that uh, accepting interfaces and returning structs gives you kind of the best flexibility without too much preemptive interface, preemptive abstraction. So uh, in Java, for example, the right way to use the language is to make everything an interface and everything works on the interfaces and you can uh, kind of exchange implementations in and out. Or at least that's the way that a lot of Java code is written. Uh, I think that it's written that way because Java doesn't have implicit interfaces. And when you have implicit interfaces, you don't need to return an interface. You can return a real struct, and the methods on the struct are methods that others can stub out in an interface. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, some libraries only expose interfaces and they keep all their structs private. Uh, libraries that do this tend to have super large interfaces. And again, a large interface is generally an anti-pattern in Go. Uh, there's another one here about you usually don't need to include interfaces from outside your package or the standard library. Um, it's okay to do, right? There are sometimes situations where you need to do it. But you generally don't need to so remember on the logger pa uh, page that I had, I didn't need to include the log package necessarily. I just said, oh, I'm an interface that kind of looks like the log package, and you can give me that or something else. And so that's a way of getting around having to include another package. Uh, so there's this library called context that existed outside the Go spec, right? Outside the Go library. And it was just like an extra library. People loved it. So they ignored this rule, and they decided to include other libraries in their API. And now context is moving to a different path. And so these same people kind of have this uh, debate about which path do I support in my API, right? If you generally uh, follow the rule of just not including things outside your package, you'll avoid situations like that. And uh, an API that uses standard objects is definitely easier to implement. So let's do a thought example. Let's say I want to make a random package. So randomly, I choose the rand package. And uh, so there's lots of ways to generate random things, right? So I may think, you know what? I'm going to have an interface of all the different ways to generate random things. And I'm going to implement this, and that's going to be my random package. Uh, there's a problem with this. And it is that the interface is super, super big, right? So how do I uh, fix that? Hmm. So one way to fix that is to think about uh, what is the actual part that needs to be stubbed and creating a struct out of all your logic. So when you use the random package, you don't get a random interface, right? You get a random struct. And that struct has logic that then uses the much, much smaller uh, source interface. So this is a good pattern to follow. If you have really large interfaces, try to put your logic in a struct 
and think about the smallest interface you can expose that gives you the behavior you need. Dealing with problems. So if you don't write buggy code, you don't need to deal with this slide. Um, but if you do, like me, you might. So one problem, when to panic? Uh, never. Um, so again, not assist, no absolutes. Uh, there are some situations where panicking is okay. I would generally advise you against panicking. And if you panic and a spawned goroutine, uh, I, I generally, I super dislike you. Uh, like, because I don't have control over that spawned goroutine that you did. And now you're panicking. It just, ah, it's terrible. Um, so there are general situations where panicking is okay, and they're kind of mirrored in the standard library. One of them is a function that kind of begins with must. These are generally used in your init function. So uh, panicking in init is probably the best place to panic, right? Because you're deploying your code, you're in front of a computer, and it panics when you deploy, so you can like debug it. You don't want to deploy your code and go home and watch a movie and you got to Get a, you're trying to catch Pokemon and you get a pager duty alert. Like you don't you don't want that. So panicking during a net is generally the thing you want to do. Um, so the must compile would be an example of the must pattern that kind of happens. So you do your compile. If it errors, you panic. Otherwise, you kind of return what you have. Uh, operations on nil are generally okay to panic on if it's a right operation, and uh, sometimes really weird state, so like the wait group, for example, if you're using a wait group incorrectly, it'll panic. But I would advise you strongly to try not to panic in life and in Go, and in presenting. Uh, so checking errors. Um, check all your errors. And you may think, well, do I really need to check an error on this thing that probably isn't going to error? Yes, like especially that one. Especially. Um, you can always do something with an error. So you can bubble it up the stack. Maybe you can't. Maybe you're in a Go routine, right? So you log it. Maybe you're worried that's too much logging. So just increment something, like something, increment it. Um, you should have a metrics platform, right? You all do? Good. So it should be incremented, and it should be put on a graph so you can kind of chart it and look at SEVs and see, oh, the graph went up and went down. Um, you always check errors. Like, we have traded exceptions for errors. And um, there's good sides and bad sides of exceptions, but if you don't check all your errors, then you're not fully getting all the good sides of not having exceptions. So. Please, please, please check your errors. And I've seen errors uh, abused. So this is kind of a, a side of checking errors. It's just kind of returning errors. When should you return an error? Uh, so I formalized it for myself. And I'm going to share with you my formal definition of when I think an error is appropriate. Um, when a promise could not be kept or when an answer cannot be given. So what do I mean by that? Um, so your function generally is promising to do something, right? If it's not promising to do anything, and it's not giving you an answer, then why are you calling it, right? So if your function promises to open a socket or write to a file, uh, and it can't, then you, uh, an error is generally OK because you're failing on that promise. Or maybe your function calculates things, and it can't calculate what you asked it to calculate. And so you can return an error that's like generally acceptable. Uh, a counterexample where I see libraries using errors is authentication. So if you have like a permissions check on a user, um, is it, did you fail a promise or fail to give an answer if the user is not authenticated? Like that, that's, you didn't really fail, the function didn't fail if the user is not authenticated. The function has successfully done what you asked it to do. It's saying no, this user is not authenticated. There are ways that authentication can fail, right? You can fail a socket. You can kind of have an RPC issue. So there are definitely ways where asking a question about authentication can fail. But I would, as a general rule, I see this a lot. I would not return errors if you're able to actually do what you promised to do. Uh, debugability for your library. So this is more important for libraries that are really long or really complex. 
Uh, so maybe your library is talking to Kafka, and it's got to maintain this weird state machine. If I'm using your library, uh, I'm responsible for it working right. So I'm going to want metrics, and I'm going to want debuggability, and I'm going to want logs into your library. So there's three general ways that you can get debuggability. One of them is debug logging. Uh, debug logging uh, has its uh, people that don't like it uh, because it can be verbose, and sometimes it's difficult to turn off. Uh, two that I'm definitely partial to are a stats struct and a var function. So stats structs uh, inside really complex libraries, you can just say, every time there's a request, increment a number. Every time something fails, increment a number. Every time this goes through, increment like how long it took, right? And then you can expose those to your users and they can decide to print it or send it to a metrics gathering system or something like that. Um, and XVAR, you can expose things like what, how it's configured. So sometimes, I will use a library, and it's not doing what I expect it to do. And I will really wish that like, I knew what host it was talking to, or how many thread uh, go routines it was configured to run. And if you, so if you can expose that information via, via XVAR, then I can easily kind of go to an endpoint, and I can see how that library was configured. And you're just giving people information and debuggability about the library, because maybe it didn't get configured the way they thought it was. Designing for testing. So there's two parts to designing for testing as a library. One of them is making a library that's easy for you to test, and the other is making a library that's easy for other people to test. So one way that people will do this is they will make a wrapper for their library that can pretend to be their library. And so HTTP test, you know, it can pretend to be a full server. Um, maybe you're implementing Zookeeper, for example, so you have a test implementation that looks like your API, but generally does what Zookeeper does. Zookeeper may be a little bit more complicated. Maybe memcache might be a better example, right? You could easily do an in-memory memcache as like a testable stub you give people. Um, I think the primary takeaway is to maintain control. So there are things in your library that you don't have full control over. So that could be like the system time, that could be doing OS calls, that could be IO. And you want to maintain control over the logic of your library. And there's two ways to do that. I have them both here. You don't necessarily need to do both. The first is, uh, so inside my scheduler, I have a now function that returns a time dot time. And if people are using the scheduler, they can stub out time with their own time so that they can kind of pretend to be a scheduler. And if they didn't, then you're just going to use time dot time, right? So it's very similar to the pattern I showed earlier. Uh, sometimes you can't do that because you need trim struct. So what does that mean? I mean, uh, you don't want to put another pointer in a struct that you're going to make a million times. Right, because it's going to use a bunch of memory, and you don't want to like waste memory like that. In those cases, it's generally okay to have a a stub per package, right? So you can stub now in the package, and people can kind of stub it out if they want. And now it just starts with time dot now. Concurrency. Oh goodness. So this is why we use Go. Uh, channels. So there are few examples of channels in Go's public API. Uh, when, when Go came out, it didn't have a lot of features, but the two that it had that seemed a little bit different were channels and Go routines. So as a new developer, you may think, uh, Go is this great thing, and it's got channels and Go routines, so I should just use them all over the place. This is like how you write really good code. Um, no. Uh, so the API for the Go library has very, very few instances of actually using channels in it. Um, my advice on channels is if you feel yourself using channels in your API, try to push that need up the stack. So try to make the user do the channel stuff and you just return dumb, simple functions. You just do simple things and the user uses those, uh, can put them on channels or kind of feed them in from channels. Sometimes you're writing a library that has certain efficiency constraints where you, you absolutely need the channel inside your library, and that's, that's fine. 
Um, but generally, you don't want channels as part of your public API. Like, just let the user do that. And mixing channels and mutexes uh, can be super dangerous. So generally, like, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying they're, they're two different philosophies on uh, concurrency and, like, how you, you know, pass messages and whether or not things should block. If you're mixing mutexes and channels and you're, like, you're using them in between each other, you could get into weird deadlock situations. So I'm not saying don't mix them. I'm just saying if you have code that is using both mutexes and channels, that's, like, the code you want to look at more than other parts for deadlock. But, yeah, honestly, just push channels to the user. Like, try not to do it. So the same kind of goes with Go routines. Uh, so one example is the HTTP server that's built into Go. So the HTTP server that's built into Go has this method called serve, and the method blocks. You could imagine someone implementing it where serve didn't block, and serve happened in a Go routine for you, right? But that's taking control away from you, the user of the, ser of the server. So instead of doing that, they have made serve a function that you are required to run in a Go routine if you want to. And uh, that's generally the pattern that I would like best in libraries, is where you let the user spawn it in a Go routine, let the user decide if they want it in a Go routine or not. And if you do make a Go routine, please clean them up, please. So you should have a close function, it should kill all your Go routines, you should totally make sure they all stop. Um, lots of like really bad bugs not cleaning up Go routines. Sometimes you may think, oh, do I need a Go routine for this thing I'm only making once? But I'm writing a test or a benchmark, and now I have like a million Go routines in my benchmark, and that's like not so fun. So please clean up your Go routines. Clean up yourself. When to use context and when not to. So context is this thing, um, a lot of, got a lot of people excited, got kind of moved into Go 1.7. Uh, my personal philosophy is that all long operations should be cancelable. So you should be able to stop an operation if it happens a long time. And it's very easy to abuse this field on context called value. So context has this thing called value where you can just kind of like throw things into it. So on one hand, you only need one parameter for all your functions. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, difficult to understand. And I don't like context.value for the same reason I don't like singletons, in the sense that they both obscure the state of your program. So you could think of a function, it has inputs, it does an output. If you use context.value or you use singletons, your function has inputs and like these other inputs that aren't really clear, and then it does this output. And so the code's kind of less clear to the user. So, um, my general kind of philosophy on value is that it should inform, not control. So what do I mean by inform, not control? So a request ID informs logic, right? It doesn't actually control the logic of something. So okay, we can kind of put that in context of value. Uh, what's something that would control logic? Maybe a user ID or if this person's authenticated, right? So that's something that isn't just informing, it's actually controlling what happens in the logic. And when you add control information into context.value, you're obscuring for the user the inputs to their function. Uh, and generally, uh, advice for using context, I would try not to store it. I would think mentally of context as something that flows through the program. So a context happens and it's, it's flowing through your function calls, it's flowing through your callbacks all the way out the program. Seriously though, try not to use context.value. Okay, so this is kind of the philosophy that I feel all my slides have led up to. If something's hard to do, make someone else do it. And I think, if you get anything else, uh, this is the best piece of advice for libraries and system design and software engineering and all. Uh, don't do hard things. And uh, the less hard things you do, the less likely you'll screw up the things you're trying to do. 
and what are hard things, right? So threading and deadlock and channels and encryption, like all oh, these hard things. So this philosophy is actually kind of reflected in some of the advice I've given. So for example, uh, don't construct the struct for them, let them construct the struct. Don't make the Go routine for them, make them make the Go routine. Don't take the channel, let them use the channel, right? Um, don't take a dependency, kind of take an interface and let them give you the dependency. So the corollary to this is, of course, uh, just try not to do things. Um, if you follow this advice, you will write really good libraries. So don't do hard things. Like, that's the best advice for writing libraries. Uh, designing for efficiency. So correctness, 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 then efficiency. Okay, got that out of the way. Um, the, maybe some of you have had other experiences, but 100% of my experience optimizing Go code is reducing memory allocations. Just 100%. I, I wish I would write code that could be optimized otherwise. And the thing that you should consider as the owner of an API, as the writer of an API, is to don't force memory allocations on your user. So I have two examples here. Um, and I actually got this encode example from a real library. And this encode example is like taking an object, oh, you want to encode it to get some bytes, so I'm going like to return the bytes for you. This API is forcing a memory allocation on the user. Rather, the write to interface is not forcing an allocation on the user. And it's really easy to optimize the internals of your structure, but it's very, very, very hard to optimize your API after the fact, right? Because people are using encode. How are you gonna optimize that? You need some transition pattern, you need to communicate. This is really hard. But you can easily optimize the inside of object. So don't design APIs that force memory allocation on the user. Uh, using vendor and libraries. <sighs> um, package management is not ideal for Go libraries. That's the toned down version of the slides. Um, it's, yeah. Uh, so my advice is don't use the vendor feature in your library. Um, you can run into really weird issues if you do. For example, if you do vendor it and you expose it as part of your public API, uh, github-a is not the same as github-b slash vendor slash github slash a. So you could end up exposing an API that's really difficult for the user to use. Um, and if you do vendor code, I would mentally think of it as code you wrote and own, which is a little bit different, right? Um, if you have a dependency in your Maven, right, you don't think of yourself as owning that library in your library. But if you vendor code, you need to think of yourself as owning it. Because what if that code uses a singleton and the, the, the Go doc for the code works just great, but it uses a singleton and now it doesn't work anymore because someone else has it vendored differently and there's these two singletons and they're not really singletons, they're biotins and the, it doesn't satisfy its promises. So I would think of code you vendor as code that you've actually written, which is another way of saying just don't vendor code. And uh, honestly, don't use libraries in your library. Uh, that's the best way to just get out of all of this trouble is, you know, it's like the five stages of grief. You just get to acceptance and just don't use libraries in your library. That's my strong advice. And it's actually not so hard to do because Go has implicit interfaces. So you can make an interface for the library you wish you would depend on. So it's not like super hard to do. And uh, I would suggest searching for npm left pad for examples of library dependencies that can cause issues. Cool. Uh, so the last, uh, one other part I want to talk about is supporting future versions of Go in your library. So Go is backwards compatible, but not forward compatible, I wish. Uh, so if you want to use this new feature, like the cancel ob part of a request object, you can use build tags and have one file for go 1.5 and up, and you use this fancy feature, and then 
another version where you either just panic and say not supported or you uh, actually don't do that. Um, <laughs> where you use it uh, without having to actually make it as part of the struct. So you have some kind of workaround. And I've had a lot of luck uh, doing integration tests for my builds with uh, slash slash plus build integration and my integration test files. So something to consider for your library. Staying clean. So you've got this great thing. How do you make sure it keeps working? There are many static analysis tools for Go. And uh, in my opinion, I think that's a side effect of the simplicity of the syntax, is that it's very easy to kind of churn out these static analysis tools. So if you're new to Go, I would recommend just use all of them. And uh, once you're kind of experienced, you can kind of grep away or realize which ones don't kind of make sense for you. But there are a lot of them out there. And if you're writing open source software, uh, there are services like Travis and Circle where you can have your code built continuously and make sure it always works. Um, this is also an argument for not depending on libraries, because if you depend on libraries, then your code could break and you never know because the library changed and broke it and you never knew. Uh, so, yeah. So that is my talk. Uh, thank you so much. I Please give me feedback on my email address. And yeah, that's it. Thank you.